Hello, everybody. I'm talking. I'm talking. You should be able to hear it. I'm not saying anything of value, but it is I am talking. Can you hear me? Bob, can you hear me talking? Bob, can you hear me talking? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? How about now? Okay, so it will work. Okay, good. We'll make it work.
today that uh, you find that uh, th th this is an uplifting time for you. If you're visiting with us, we are thankful that you're here, thankful that uh, you've chosen to come out and worship with us uh, today as well. A couple of uh, quick announcements, and I told a couple of people, it seems kind of strange to be saying, hey, this month's collection is going to begin to be cold weather gear. Uh, when it's going to be 92 out today, mm -hmm. but uh, it is going to get cold. I think you can pretty well depend on that. And we are going to be collecting for Aurora. There's a box in the uh, uh, foyer, and we'll be collecting caps and gloves and those kind of things over the next two to three months uh, for those that are homeless and those that are in uh, in special need. One of the uh, 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 we got a thank you card. And let me read it just simply. It says, Newburgh Church of Christ, thank you so much for your donation of school supplies and water bottles. We know these will be much needed during the school year. We appreciate all you do for, uh, this is uh, SES, and that's uh, Sharon Elementary School, uh, for the students and the staff. Thanks again. So uh, just one of the, uh, the things that we try to do uh, on a monthly basis, and again, they're Thanks for, uh, for the things that we're, we're given there. We have several that are on our prayer list, continue to be on our prayer list. Uh, Natalie, um, Natalie Hart with uh, a brain uh, tumor that uh, is being treated, and we need to continue to remember her. Also, Hannah uh, mentioned last week with the diabetes. I don't have an update. Uh, they're still doing tests, and uh, so we want to continue to remember her as well. Any other announcements we need to make? Winnie. Oh, Winnie is having surgery tomorrow, tomorrow morning. So we need to have her in our prayers as well. Thank you for, I guess, I knew that, didn't, didn't think of it. I need, any other announcements as we go into the week? Lots of needs that are around us. Mighty is our God. Mighty is our King, mighty is our Lord, the ruler of everything. Glory to our God, glory to our King, glory to our Lord, the ruler of everything. His name is higher, higher than any other name. His power is greater, for he is created
Let's go to our Father in prayer. Heavenly Fathers, we come before you this morning. Uh, we're mindful, Father, of the uh, remembrance that were held yesterday and uh, in, in honor of those who uh, perished in the uh, disaster of 9-11 20 years ago. Father, it was a, a day of prayer and uh, remembering, and Father, we, uh, we too pray for all those who uh, lost loved ones. Pray, pray for our country, Father, that um, she will remain strong and, and, uh, and fight against the evils that caused uh, that great disaster. Father, we uh, pray that as we go forward, we, uh, we continually look to you for the guidance and the uh, and it's just the satisfaction of knowing that uh, you are God and, and Jesus is our Savior. Father, we thank you uh, that you sent him to the earth, that he taught as he did, that he left a message that has reverberated down through the ages. And Father, just help us to uh, keep in mind is our duty to continue to proclaim him. Father, as we go continue in this uh, worship time, we pray that you would be with us. Help us, Father, to, uh, to worship you in the manner you wish to be worshiped. Uh, worshiped. And uh, we just thank you again for the opportunity to be here. We pray for uh, those that uh, are less fortunate, unable to be with, her, with us today uh, on various sick lists. Especially pray for Winnie as uh, she will be undergoing surgery tomorrow, we pray that uh, that surgery will be successful and she will uh, again be uh, free from the pain that has uh, plagued her. Continue to be with us as we worship together, Father. Thank you for this opportunity. We ask your blessings on each one here and ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.
Welcome. Welcome. Good. Okay. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Sam, for choosing that song. <clears throat> that is, uh, I think, very appropriate for kind of how we feel right now. No matter what's going on, God is still in charge, and we know where our future is going to be. Okay. Now, <clears throat> before we begin... Does anyone need a communion packet that's on the back table? Because we can certainly get you one. Um, at the conclusion of this devotional, there will be, we will do a prayer together, and then uh, we will take all of the communion together um, as a way of, of unity of our members. <clears throat> you know, habits are a good thing. They help us get through the day. Uh, they help us get through our day, and it just makes life easier. I'm sure that you have your habits that you do each morning. I certainly have my habits. Brush my teeth, get dressed, walk the dog, then kiss my wife. Or is it that I walk my wife and then kiss the dog? I, I think, no, 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 I think I had it right the first time. Um, and then, I don't want to forget coffee. Coffee is an important part of my morning routine. Uh, most of us, without our habits, we would be totally lost. Habits are important because they involve routine. Habits allow us to do things without thinking. In a way, habits are a lot like autopilot. Habits and routines sometimes get in our way, though, of our ability to focus our mind on what things are important. We forget it, we just do it by rote. Taking communion can become a habit. Something we do every Sunday. Something we do by rote. Something that we do without thinking. For some of us, you can decide for yourself, but for some of us, we have been taking communion each Sunday for 50 or 60 years. Think about that, 50 or 60 years. And some of you, it's probably more. For me, it's 50, right around 50. And I think that it's very easy to make that a habit. Something we do, check off our list on Sunday, and then go home. First Corinthians 11, 28 through 32, has something to say that I think is very appropriate for us now. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat the bread and drink the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body eat and drink judgment on themselves. They, 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 that, that is why many of us among you are weak and sick and, an, and, many, and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we do more discerning with regard to ourselves, we would not come under such judgment. Nevertheless, when we are judged in this way by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we, so that we will not be finally condemned by the world. I want to encourage you right now to stop that internal dialogue that you're having with yourself. Clear your mind. And spend a few moments examining yourself before you take communion. Ask yourself, where are you right now with the Lord? Will you pray with me? Thank you, Lord, for your love. Thank you for your son's willingness to die on the cruel cross so that we could have salvation and to spend eternity with you. Help us to always examine ourselves in relation to where you want us to be. Bless this bread and this cup and help us to always be discerning as we partake. In Jesus' name, amen.
for the uh, message this morning. Okay, good. Um, before I start with my looking at some more myths of the, that we believe in, um, I want to encourage you to uh, go see a movie that I saw with my family last night uh, called Show Me the Father. Show Me the Father. I think it's just playing at the movie, the AMC on the west side of, of uh, Evansville. Show Place 2, okay. Um, anyway, find it. I would encourage you to do it, to go and see it. Um, it's kind of hard to describe, it was for me, to hide to describe what this movie is about. I, I think it's written by the, written and directed by the Kendricks brothers, which is the same group that um, directed um, Courageous, if you saw Courageous, or War Room, or Face the Giants. Uh, pardon me? Fireproof, okay. Uh, I would encourage you to watch it. I, I think the, um, if I can kind of describe it, I think the overall theme is kind of pointing us towards what a wonderful father God is to us. That's kind of the overarching thing. And through some series of some different vignettes kind of a thing, it shows us how we can be better fathers. Uh, and it helps us deal with the fact of maybe, maybe our father wasn't the greatest. Maybe he didn't meet our needs, or maybe he was absent, or whatever. He uses a lot of scripture. That's the kind of thing where you wish you had taken note somehow. But um, I would encourage you to, to go and see it. Um, it will spark a discussion with someone, whoever you see it with. The group that I saw it with, we sparked a discussion about that. About um, our fathers. Uh, about how God is our father, how God is our perfect father. So I want to encourage you, show me the father, is the name of it, and I really want to encourage you to go and see it. Okay. <clears throat> I want to ask you a question. Have you ever been in a valley? Have you ever been in a valley? And I'm not talking about that cool and quiet valley filled with lush, lush vegetation and chirping birds. 
I'm talking about the valley that David mentions in Psalms 23, 4, where he calls it the valley of the shadow of death. Let's quickly look at it. Even though I walk through the valley, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. This is the kind of valley that can best be described as being very lonely, very depressing, very fearful, sometimes dangerous, very painful to us, and sometimes just gives us a sense of being totally overwhelmed. Have you ever been in such a place in your life? It's a place that's just not comfortable. It's a place that we would choose not to visit, and we would do our best to get out of it as quick as we can. Now, this morning, I would like to spend our time together examining this myth that if, or should I say when, we are in the valley, in a dark and lonely valley, that we, will, that we think we've done something wrong or we've just made a wrong turn. That's kind of what I want to look at. When we're in that valley, did we make a wrong turn? Did we do something wrong? That's what I want to examine. Now, I, I think we can all agree that sometimes life is just not great. Sometimes just getting through the day is just not great. Things happen. No matter how, how well we, that our life is going, at times, we will find ourselves walking through the valley of darkness. We really, really wanted a mountaintop experience. That's what we wanted. But we got a valley experience. The valley can re represent all kinds of low places in our lives. Prolonged unemployment or simply losing a job. A problem with our relationships, struggles with a personal matter, struggles with addiction. Sometimes it's the serious illness of a family member. And sometimes it's just the challenge of every day dealing with a chronic illness that we know is not going to get better. Those can be valleys in our lives. But I want to make sure as we talk about this that we're connecting with what is a valley experience. And this is how I define it. It's a prolonged period of time and of pain and of suffering that we just want to escape. It involves time and pain and suffering and we just don't want to be there. I believe it's a myth to assume that God's leading will always take us to that mountaintop. And going through the valley means that we are no longer walking the path of righteousness. Let's see if that's an accurate statement. What does a valley even look like? There, sometimes there are valleys that we go through that are just completely out of our control. There are things like medical issues, sudden deaths, economic downturns that affect our business, job downsizing, which affects our paycheck, and when other people's behavior impact on our lives. That is when there's not much we can do except have faith, trust God, and endure it. Oftentimes, these experiences, while painful, can help us see that God is truly working in our lives. Through a messy situation that we're forced to go through, we can see the miraculous power of God's deliverance. You know, sometimes we just want to run away from that pain, we'll do just about anything. And when we do, we just cause pain to other people. Sometimes our desire to avoid pain is so great that we are willing to break promises. We are willing to hurt people, do what's best for us. Because after all, doesn't the world tell us 
Sometimes you just got to do what you got to do. Sometimes being in a valley will just cause us to hurt people close to us and betray our friends. <coughs> but if we look at scripture, it tells us just the opposite way of we should act. In Psalms 15, 1 through 5, Lord, who may dwell in your sacred tent? Who may live on your holy mountain? The one who walks is the one who, whose walk is blameless, who does what is righteous, who speaks the truth from their heart, whose tongue utters no slander, who does, do, who does not wrong as na- the wrong to a neighbor or, and casts no slur on others, who despises a vile person but honors those who fear the Lord, who keeps an oath even when it hurts and does not change his mind, who lends money to the poor without interest, who does not accept a bribe against the innocent, whoever does these things will never be shaken. Unfortunately, there are many times in some people's marriages to, in their attempt to avoid the pain and avoid the commitment of, for better or worse, they substitute the idea of, until I stop being happy. When this happens, needless people, excuse me, innocent people are needlessly hurt. You know, I think on one level, part of us that knows that the dark valleys are used to train us, to equip us for spiritual battle, to build our character, and sometimes we're there to carry out God's will. But it really changes. I, thought, I think our thinking changes about this deep, dark valley when it's our valley, when we're walking through it. Sometimes it's very hard to believe that an all-knowing and all-loving God would allow us to endure a p- lengthy period of frustration and disappointment. I think that is why when we find ourselves in that dark and lonely valley, we look to find the quickest way out. I think it's naturally to assume that we have done something wrong if we are in that valley, that we must have done something wrong. But I think it doesn't necessarily mean that a wrong turn got us to that valley. Why are we there? The answer to the question, it all depends. Our valleys come in all shapes and sizes. Some are time limited and they will end. Some are t- so others look like they will last forever. Some are self-induced. <laughs> Sometimes we're in a valley because of what we did. Sometimes they're the results of just living in a fallen world that we live in. Some are obviously God's will. And some are just unknown. And we will not know why until we get to heaven. But I also think that when we get to heaven, if we've had one of those valley experiences, it just doesn't make sense. I think when we get to heaven, we won't care. (laughs) We truly will not care because of where we are. When I think we're in that valley, when we, when we go to that valley, and again, it's not an if, it's a when. It, when we go to that valley, there are three questions that we need to ask ourselves. I think this will help clarify for us what's going on. And they will help answer, did we just mess up? Or, we have, or, or have we been placed in this valley by God's direction? The three questions are, why am I here? How should I respond? And what can I learn? Let's look at that first question. Why am I here? Sometimes being a valley means that we're in the wrong, we just took the wrong turn. But again, sometimes it means something altogether different. Sometimes we're in a valley because God sent us there. Why would God want to send us to a valley why would he want us to do that because he either wants to show us something 
or he wants to teach us something. I think that's what happened to the Israelites when they left Egypt. Now, this story is in Exodus chapter 4. We're not going to read it or anything, but it's Exodus chapter, chapter 4, 14. And I hope you'll read that. But this is kind of the story. The Israelites have left Egypt. They've all witnessed the, the, um, all the miracles that Moses has done, and they've left Egypt. And they are now boxed in by two mountains on either side, an, impa- impass- an impassable body of water in the front, and an angry and ven- vengeful army behind them. You probably know the rest of the story. Probably, I'm thinking right now, you are, if you've ever watched the movie The Ten Commandments with Charles, Hes- Charles-, Charles and Heston, you are playing that video clip in your head of them getting ready to cross the Red Sea. And they crossed the Red Sea, and we know that the sea was parted. The Israelites walked on dry land to the other side. The Egyptians take an eternal bath and are no longer a problem. Because we know what happens, this story is not scary to us, because we know how it ended. But it didn't for the Israelites. For us, that valley didn't seem too long or too deep which is too scary, but to the Israelites it did. Now, does that story ever excite you? Would you like to see that story happen? Would you like to be kind of up on a mountain watching that happen? I would. I would love it. It would be the most exciting thing in that story. Because you know why? Because I know how it ends. But we have to remember that the Israelites did not know how it would end. I'm sure those Israelites were scared. They got through. They got through on dry land. They got through the other side. They got to see their enemy destroyed. God put them right where he wanted them to be. Because the Israelites witnessed the power of and the majesty of God. And the Israelites got to experience, God will take care of me. God is wonderful. In Luke 8, 23 through 25, we see the same kind of story playing out, only this time it's Jesus and his disciples. And this is what it said. One day Jesus said to his disciples, Let us go over to the other side of the lake. So they got into a boat and set out. As they were sailing, he fell asleep. Talking about Jesus, he fell asleep. A squall came down on the lake so that the boat was being swamped and they were in great danger. The disciples went and woke him saying, Master, Master, we are going to drown. He got up and rebuked the wind and the raging waters. The storm subsided. And all was calm. Where is your faith, he asked the disciples. In fear and amazement, they asked one another, Who is this? He commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him. This is how this story unfolds. Jesus and his disciples are in a boat during a storm. The disciples panicked. Jesus slept until he was woken by his disciples. Jesus calms the storm and teaches the disciples about faith and his authority. Again, those disciples were exactly where they needed to be at that moment. That could be why we're in a valley. Because God wants us to be there to teach us or to show us something. You know, but sometimes we're in a valley because we just simply mess up. We just simply mess up. Most of the dark valleys that King David went through was because he sinned and he experiences the consequences of his behavior. We talked about in the past about how he he took the wrong turn with Bathsheba and he ended up sinning. Sometimes we end up in a valley because of our behavior and our sins. In a moment, we're going to look what we need to do when we get into that valley, that dark valley, 
because of our sins and we just messed up. We're going to look at a way to take care of that. But sometimes, and then sometimes, we're in a valley that for the reason that is totally beyond our understanding, we'll never know. <clears throat> I think Job, the story of Job is a great example. Never knew. In Job 1, verses 1 through 3, this is what it says about Job. In the land of Uz, there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and he shunned evil. He had seven sons and three daughters, and he owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 cam 3, camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 donkeys, and had a large number of service, servants. He was the greatest man among the people of the East. You know, the Bible said that Job was blameless and upright, and God allowed him to be tested by the devil. If you read the book of Job, there is no indication that Job ever knew what was going on in his life. He never knew the backstory. God never explained to him the conversation that he had with the devil. God, Job never knew the restraints that God put on the devil. He was totally unaware. And sometimes when we get in a valley, we don't know why we're there. And we may never know why we're there. Now, the second question we can ask ourselves is, how should I respond? Okay? Why am I here? How do I respond? Well, how you respond depends on what kind of valley you're in. If God sent us to a certain valley, if God's the one that sent us to a certain valley, all I can say to you is the answer is to hang tough. Have faith. Believe in God. Do what you can do to keep your spirits up and hang tough. We see this happening, this story. We see this happening when Daniel was put in the lion's den. Remember that story from your childhood. Daniel... The commandment was to not pray for 30 days. Daniel disobeyed. Daniel continued to pray to God. Daniel could have followed the earthly plan and stopped praying for 30 days. Earthly problem solved. David decides to follow God. David kept praying, and he ended up spending the night with some hungry lions. David was not harmed. <clears throat> In Daniel 6, 23, 24, this is what it says. The king was overjoyed and gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. And when Daniel was lifted from the den, listen to this, no wounds were found on him because he had trusted in his God. As God, and at the king's command, the men who where had falsely accused Daniel, were brought in and thrown into the lion's den, along with their wives and their children. And before they reached the floor, the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. God was in that lion's den with him. Those lions were still hungry, and they took care of it. Now, in some of our situations when we're in a valley, it is very appropriate to just change our direction. This is usually true when we're in a dark valley because we messed up. If a wrong turn got us there, then retracing our steps needs to happen and get us where we need to really be going. When we find ourselves in a valley because of a poor choice, these two things need to happen in our lives. Number one, we need to take responsibility, and we need to repent. Number two, we need to make a serious course correction. Oftentimes, we'll not take away all the consequences, but we need to make a serious course correction. There are still sometimes debts to be paid. Sometimes when we mess up, the devil will try to send us a shortcut to get us out of that valley. When we mess up, the devil is there to give us a little shortcut. When we consider lying 
to cover up our mess up? That is coming from the devil. That is coming from the devil. Now, the enemy's shortcut sometimes work in the short term. It sometimes gets us out of the immediate problem. But it usually makes our life more complicated. Simply, we have to remember the lie. So we can tell another lie to cover it. But it never works out in the long run. And it certainly will never work out in eternity. The third question we need to ask ourselves, what can I learn from this valley? There is always a lesson to be learned. There is, sometimes it's to help us build our character or strengthen our faith. Sometimes we have to learn something. Sometimes the valley of injustice will teach us to understand the sufferings of Jesus Christ, who was wrongly charged with things. Sometimes a valley of pain will teach us to understand and support other people who are in pain. Sometimes the valley of suffering teaches us simply to obey and to trust God. Pain has a way of reducing us down to our basic level when all we have left is to trust and obey God. A valley of self-induced hardship teaches us, don't ever go there again. Don't do that again. James 1, 2 through 5 says this about it. Consider it pur pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kind, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you can be mature, and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. I think James' three, ta three takeaways from this letter is this. Number one, rejoice. If you're in a valley, rejoice. God is still with you. Number two, persevere. Never give up. And number three, ask for wisdom because it will be given to you generously. Now, in closing, I want to kind of do these thoughts for you. Number one, not every trip through the valley is a good thing. Sometimes a trip is just not fun. It hurts. Now, every trip through the valley is because we did a bad thing. Sometimes we have lessons to learn. We need to ask, we need to pray and ask God for discernment on what we need to do. You know, Jesus went through a valley called the cross. He knows how we feel. Jesus went through a valley. You know, it doesn't matter if you are on a mountaintop or you're in a deep, dark, scary value. The question that we each need to ask ourselves is this. Who is your shepherd? Who is your shepherd? If Jesus is not your shepherd, let us know. We can show you how to make that work. We can show you in Scripture how the, we, you, what you need to do to make Jesus your shepherd. Now, if you are already a Christian, we need to re always renew the idea that Jesus is our shepherd and he will always take care of us. He will always take care of us. <clears throat> if, you're, um, if you're joining us over the internet today, if you have any questions about what was said today or what you need to do to become a Christian, Will you please let us know? We will be more than happy to stop what we're doing and share the gospel with you. If you're here today, let one of the elders know, let me know, and we'll offer the, the, same, the same thing to you. I want to close with these final words. Until the next time we meet, wherever that might be, take care and stay safe.
close out this morning, Gary's asked me to lead the closing prayers. He's kind of managing the booth in the back. Um, we do want to thank everyone for being here. Thank you for the uh, uh, message, Glenn, and for all the, uh, the ways that we've been able to be focused on uh, our worship to God. Would you pray with me? Father, you, you bless us in so many ways, and sometimes it's easy to take those things for granted. Lord, help us to be uh, aware and, and, and focused on the things that are around us that matter to, uh, to you. Help us, Father, to be sensitive to the needs that, uh, that we see. Help us, Lord, to respond to those in ways that you give us the abilities. And Lord, just help us in whatever ways that, uh, that we stand in need, uh, again, to let you be seen through our lives. Father, thank you for uh, the time together. Thank you for the fellowship that we can enjoy. Thank you for all the ways that, again, you, uh, you touch our lives. There are needs that are around us that uh, we're aware of, many that, uh, that we may not be uh, at this particular moment, but, but may come to uh, be aware in, in the, the days that come. Father, we have uh, special needs. We pray for Natalie, we pray for Hannah, pray for Winnie and her surgery. And all those, Lord, that are that are in our thoughts that uh, that we know about, and as we do again encounter other needs, help us, Lord, to be responsive to those in ways that honor you. Thank you for the uh, the message this morning, but thank you above all for loving us so much, Father. We do walk through valleys at times, and uh, Lord, we just uh, just pray that as you uh, help us to. To, to endure those things, to, uh, to deal with those things. Father, that we, again, honor you and, uh, and let you know you are our God. Thank you for loving us and uh, for the giving of your Son. It's because of that that we have hope of the resurrection, and we look forward to seeing you someday. Ask it in his name. Amen. I got a mansion just over the hilltop in that bright land where we'll never grow. And someday yonder we'll never wander, but walk the streets that are pure as gold. I got a mansion just over the hilltop. In that bright land where we'll never grow, and someday yonder we'll never want.